How did it feel for you all those years ago, being a pioneer in the movement, one of the pioneers? It just felt like something I had to do. Uh, I was tired of watching my people lose. Why were they losing? Uh, because they didn't know how to market. They didn't know how to take the idea of open source software to the mainstream and make it persuasive to business people, to the press, to the mainstream culture. And it was about time somebody took that on. Why do you so believe in the free and open software movement? Because I've learned from experience over the last quarter century that keeping secrets is a bad idea when you're developing software. Software that kept, that's kept secret doesn't get sufficient peer review, it doesn't get sufficient scrutiny, and bugs lurk in it forever. When did you first encounter this problem of people closing their source and not allowing other people to contribute? Oh, it's, it's been in place for my entire career. I mean, when I started as a programmer in 1976 or so, there was already a fairly serious problem with proprietary software. At the time, though, Nobody really understood that the secrecy was to blame. Uh, even uh, Richard Stallman hadn't figured that out yet. He wouldn't figure that out for another five years or so. Talking about Richard Stallman, we spoke to Richard Stallman um, about this, and I want to find out what are your feelings between the term open source versus free? Well, um, I proposed the term open source originally because in 1997 I observed that the term free software had bad karma. If you, if you said free software to a business person or your typical technology journalist, the connotations were not good. They, they, would, they would think of communism and bad things like that. And so where'd you go from there? You realize they didn't like that term. How has it affected the open source world? Well, what I decided we needed was a, a as a, I, I hate these marketing terms, but they're the only ones that are appropriate. What we needed to do was rebrand the product. It, it, it's ugly for technical people to have to think this way, but mostly, unfortunately, most of the world doesn't run on rationality and good technical decisions. It runs on what kind of image you can present, what kind of sizzle you can put on the steak. So I decided we needed better sizzle for our steak. For a large part of its lifespan, open source has been pretty much destined for people who are very understanding about computers. How has open source, this marketing term, been to reach the end user market? Uh, I don't know that it has reached the end user market a lot yet. Um, what I was after in my original strategy was to capture the Fortune 500 first. And the reason for that is because that's where the largest concentrated chunk of money is. If you look at the demand pattern that is exerted on software producers, the, the home and small business market, the end user market, is huge, but it's diffuse. It's very difficult to address that with one product or one strategy. So although in an absolute sense there's more money where the end user is and, and the end user ought to have a stronger influence on, uh, on uh, how software producers choose to license their products, in practice, the largest concentrated demand is from the Fortune 500, so I set out to, to change the demand of the Fortune 500 first. It seems to me that um, we've spoken to a lot of people on the show, and you have the most marketing sense with regards to open source. Why haven't many others adopted that approach when it comes to that? I think a lot of people have. Uh, I think a lot of the community has figured out that this is important, but uh, they figure that as long as people like me are doing the job, they don't have to worry about it. Do you ever feel that proprietary software will ever be eradicated or become second to open source? I don't think it will ever be eradicated. Uh, one of the things I've discussed in my papers, notably the third one, The Magic Cauldron, is that there are some limited circumstances in which closed source software makes economic sense. And those circumstances are never going to entirely go away. But I think we'll, we, we will arrive at a situation, a market equilibrium, where most software is open source. When do you think that will happen? Uh, I don't know. If I were good at predicting time frames, I'd be really wealthy, and I'm not. So, Let's go on to Netscape. You were instrumental in getting Netscape to release their source code. Can you uh, just tell us a bit more about that story? Sure. Uh, it came as quite a shock at the time. Um, I remember I was... Um, I was sitting at my machine hacking on something and I got email from somebody who I, I never I'd never heard from before and actually I don't think I've heard from them since and he said 
he pointed me at a web page, which was a Netscape press release, and he said, I think you ought to read this because they, they mention your name. And I went and read it, and they, did, and they indeed did mention my name. And, in fact, the whole press release read like somebody had taken my Cathedral and Bazaar paper and sort of run it through the marketees meat grinder, <laughs> saying I was, yeah, this does look like somebody's been reading my papers, and I guess I should call Netscape and find out what's going on. And I did. And I fought my way through about 15 minutes of voicemail hell, finally reached a human being, and said, uh, hi there, um, d d d would somebody please tell me what's going on? D did I have something to do with this? And I got a call back about 20 minutes later from a very nice woman uh, named Roseanne Semino, who doesn't work there anymore. And she said, yeah, you had something to do with this. Our top guys read your paper, and they loved it. And I'm going, Bleh. and uh, oh, and uh, I think our CEO wants to talk to you. And I said, I think I want to talk to him, too. So I realized at that point that uh, unless I dodged really quickly and um, fame was about to land on me, and I wasn't sure I was ready for that. I had, I, I had to think a lot about whether I was willing to take that on because I knew that uh, she said that the, the CEO had been briefing the national press about their, their new uh, strategy of openness and had attributed to my work, and that meant the press was going to come calling. And, I had to think a lot about whether I, I, I wanted to take that on or duck back into a hole. Uh, I decided to take it on, and that's why I'm talking to you today. Talking about that paper, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, mm -hmm. tell us more about that and how you came about writing it and what, it's, what exactly uh, was its essence. Oh, well, I'm, I'm okay, okay. Uh, all right, the, the, the basic thing that I, I noticed in that paper is that... Um, there had been a sort of folk practice evolving for many years in the culture of Internet hackers, and that folk practice was to solve programming problems collaboratively by passing around the source code of programs, not keeping anything secret. In fact, doing the opposite of secrecy, instituting a, a, a peer review process, a process of unlimited third-party scrutiny, very similar, in fact, to what scientists do with scientific experiments and engineers do with blueprints. Uh, and what I noticed in that paper was this works really well. It works really well for eliminating bugs from software. And furthermore, I noticed that the Linux community seemed to be a social machine that was designed to maximize the amount of peer review that Linux got. And I concluded that this probably accounted for the fact that the Linux community was breaking all of the normal rules of software engineering by having a very large, dispersed, disconnected community and very little in the way of central planning, but producing high-quality software anyway. You see, according to traditional software engineering, you're not supposed to be able to do that. According to traditional software engineering, if you're going to produce something that doesn't have a lot of bugs in it, the project group needs to be small, tightly focused, rigidly controlled. Now, that's not a very good description of the Linux community. Uh, and yet, somehow, they were breaking all the, the traditional rules and producing an amazingly high-quality operating system. And I zeroed in on this peer review phenomenon as the explanation. Eric, could you elaborate a little bit more on the term the cathedral and the bazaar? I was thinking of uh, actually an illustration in the Mythical Man Month. This is a famous book by Fred Brooks on software engineering. Um, and in that book, he compared large program systems to cathedrals. And it was Brooks who really advocated small, tightly focused uh, teams working in splendid isolation to build these cathedrals. And I wanted to set, a, and, and that metaphor has a lot of connotations of, of sort of central control, hierarchy, organizational rigidity, all of the things that you associate with the kinds of organizations that build cathedrals. And I wanted to set against that some kind of, of metaphor that was horizontal, and superficially chaotic, but in a, a fundamental and deep sense, self-organizing. I, I realized I wanted a marketplace metaphor and to sort of increase the, the rhetorical distance between that and the cathedral, I decided to make it exotic from a different culture. So the cathedral versus the bazaar. 
Eric, you're reputed to be a proud wearer of the label Hacker.